Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to School After Hours Podcast, where we talk about all things related to out of school time programming. I am your host, Jay Lee, and on today's show, we have returning guests, Curtis and Yolanda Hall. So Curtis and Yolanda have been on the show before. Yolanda's done our episodes on trauma-informed care and mindfulness. And then Curtis has also been in our show, and he's done our mentoring portion about how to pay it forward through mentoring, especially with our young men. So I will put those episodes in the show notes for you, just in case you want to go ahead and run those back and listen to them. They're really, really good information. They're going to be giving us a little bit more gems this time around as well. So for those of you that may not know, here's a little bit of information. Yolanda is a youth coach and the founder of Unbreakable Minds, an organization that provides life coaching services to teens and young adults in the Richmond area and surrounding counties. Curtis is also a youth coach. He is the founder of New Collar Solutions, an organization that provides life coaching services to young men of color between the ages of 10 to 18. Very important years in our young men's life as well as our young women. So in this episode, we're going to be talking about adjusting parenting styles as your children transition from that tween stage to that teen stage. Because as you all know, it can get a little rough, you know. Everybody's experience is different, but as they're getting older and coming into who they are and who they want to be, we want to make sure that we're equipping them with the tools and the skills that they need to be successful. So there may be some things on the back end that we may need to do as far as our parenting style goes, because as children get older and they go through different stages of life, how they were when they were younger children, like your kindergarten to first grade, It is not the same when they are your middle schoolers and high schoolers, okay? So, Yolanda and Curtis will be sharing their experience as parents going through the process of raising their wonderful two daughters. So, before we get into this interview, right, let's go ahead and go to our Community Corner. Community Corner is a segment of the show that allows guests or myself to share tips, advice, or information with families and youth in the communities that we serve. Without further ado, let's jump into our Community Corner conversation. All right, y'all. So for Community Corner, y'all, my question is, what are three things parents should be aware of as their children transition into their teenage years? What are some things that parents need to be mindful of? Because they're not going to be the baby baby no more. They're coming into their young adulthood. So to help in that transition, what are some things parents need to be mindful of? Well, first, we just want to say thank you, Ms. J. Lee, for having us on the show again and together. This is such an amazing resource. And, you know, with the work that we do, we definitely want to be able to support parents. So a few things that we would want to share with um, parents about what they should be aware of is, number one, our first job as parents is to put our oxygen mask on first. Mm. If you ask that question, what's your first job as a parent? Mm. Parents will give you 10,000 things that they need to do. That's the priority, right? But at the end of the day, their self-care is the priority because, you know, they tell you on the plane, if you can't help yourself first, then you won't be able to help anybody else. And that includes your children. And so in that and putting that oxygen mask on first to remember to grow your village, right? You know, I talk about creating a circle of support, right? And making sure that you have people in it with you, right? And so to be intentional about going out and growing that circle of support and making sure that you are not doing it alone. Even if you are married or have both parents in the household, you still need the village, right? Right. Curtis will tell you, (laughs) we are very intentional about finding resources for our girls and young people who can positively influence them. And, you know, to just stay in tune with who our children really are, right? Accepting them as their authentic selves You know, we have in our minds who we want them to be and who we hope they will be, but we're steadily getting to know them because like you said, they are steadily changing. And with every age, it comes a new stage of development. And so we definitely want to stay tuned to who they truly are and they kind of pull ourselves out of it and just focus on who they are at that stage in their lives. And the last thing I want to say, and Curtis may chime in with something, but we cannot take their actions or inactions personal. Ooh, right. That's a good one. Listen, everything we're about to talk about, you know, it's always about 
us either choosing to respond to our ch children's behavior, the things that they do and say, or whether we're going to react, right? So we have to remember that children, just like all people, they need to feel seen, heard, and understood, period. And so when that's not happening, then they use this language called behavior, <laughs> right? And so with that language, they are communicating a need. And so we just have to take a minute to try to determine what that need is and then find ways to respond versus react. Good stuff. Anything to add, Brother Curtis? The only thing I would, would build on in terms of knowing our kids, and thank you once again, Queen J. Lee, for having us on. Much love, as always. It's just being cognizant of the cultural influences that they're encountering as well. And that really builds on knowing them because we got to have one foot in the potential challenges or problems in order to be able to help them navigate. And those, we say help them navigate because we want to allow them that breath to have the flexibility to make their informed decisions in an autonomous manner, but just posture them for success. We're more facilitators and coaches more than actually being authoritative. So I'm not going to get on my box about that, but I think it's very important to find that threshold and that sweet spot. It oscillates based on where they're at. So we just got to be cognizant of that. Thank you, Curtis and Yolanda, for giving us that wonderful information. Now, let's go ahead and jump into this interview. All right, y'all. So, Yolanda and Curtis, welcome back to the show. It's been like forever. I've had you on separately, but I haven't had you on together yet. So, this is going to be real, 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 real good. I'm really excited. Yes. If you can't We're tell. Excited. <laughs> We're excited. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thanks again. <laughs> I'm really, really excited. So for those that have not tuned in, because we're in our third season, so I am getting some new people in that haven't listened to your episodes yet. They don't know the background story. So let's go ahead into that. Tell them a little bit about yourselves and how you got into youth development. So I'll pick up the pieces a little bit here and then I'll hoop it to love. So yeah. for me, it started... As a teenager, when I had my first mentor around the age 14, going on 15, around playing football, then it evolved into just an overall relationship and big brother, little brother type relationship. So I just fast forward to my college years where I served the local community in Tampa, Hillsborough area as a college student. And mm -hmm. then as I began to go through my Army career, just sharing with different youth. So that's how it's evolved. That's how I got in the space. So now it's over 20 years. And then Love and I, when we met in D.C. in hey. 05, you know, who knew how the story would pan out, but we end up connecting on this this thread here in terms of serving young people. So it was one of the beautiful things that connected us. So we said, why not do it together? So that's a short version. <laughs> All right, now. Hey, Lonnie, what's your story, girl? Go ahead, tell it, tell it. So, so my story started in... I mean, you know, I have a childhood, right? I have a, a, a my teenage years, but none of that translated to what I was going to do as an adult. When I left New York to come to college, I was coming to be a pediatrician. So I was like, you know, they say be a doctor, be a lawyer, be a police officer, right? Fire, mm -hmm. fireman, firewoman. Service job, yeah. Right, right, right. So, but I came to be a pediatrician. A couple of bumps and bruises and, and curves and all those things. And long story short, I ended up with a psychology degree. And I was like, so what am I going to do with this? Right. How can I make money with this? But I knew that I wanted to continue to work with young people. You know, volunteer work has been something I have done as since my early childhood years. And so coming into adulthood, I had to make a decision and I decided to become a school counselor. And so I spent 15 years in the schools as a school counselor. And that was the absolute best job or best career that I could have ever had. And so coming out of that, working there for some years and then transitioning into the mental health arena, working in the mental health department here in Richmond, actually in Henrico, I decided during the pandemic that there had to be a better way to serve. There had to be a better way to meet the needs of young people, knowing they were going to come out of the pandemic even more confused and with more challenges and things like that. And I decided to start Unbreakable Minds Youth Life Coaching. And so, like Curtis said, you know, throughout the years, we had each had our experiences working with young people and we would come home and talk about it. And that was the time that we noticed each other lighting up, right? Mm -hmm. We had our jobs, we were getting our paychecks and our salary, but well, nobody lighting up about that, right? <laughs> we, you know, we were lighting up because we were working with kids. Well, I was, but you know, just the service part, being able to do it on our own terms, volunteer where we wanted to work with the groups that we wanted to. Those experiences is what was 
lighting us up and doing things a little bit differently, that we would both start companies where we could work with young people on our own terms. Mm -hmm. And so Unbreakable Minds Coaching was born and New College Solutions was born all in 2021. Yes. Uh, Yes. This story, this story. So we wanted to sit down and have this conversation because we circled around like mentoring, coaching for youth, preteens and teens. We also talked about trauma. We had you on the episode for that, Yolanda, talking about trauma within self, but also trauma with children and kind of help them through that process in the OST space, out of school time programming space. So we wanted to do a little bit more, go into the segments of how can we help parents or give parents some little tidbits about helping them as their children transition to that preteen teenager stage because it can be a lot for the child that you knew it's like who is this individual what is going on hold (laughs) up hold up i need everybody to pump a break like hold on what we doing yes yes yes. (laughs) everybody (laughs) i need everybody to pump a break but also sharing with parents like different styles that they also need to know and be aware of to kind of exercise in their practice and in their day to day. So the question that I have of what I want to ask you is, why did you all want to focus on making parenting or making parent and child relationship building a part of your practice? Like, why was that an important component for y'all outside of or in addition to like your youth development programs? Right. So the parent child relationship is always present, right? It's always present. And based on the experience, it all starts in the home. And so based on the experiences that the young people have in their, in their home life, you know, the behaviors that they see their parents exhibiting, just the experiences that they have at home and with their families and in their neighborhoods, that determines how they think, sometimes how they feel, how they behave, how they show up in the world right? How they show up in the world as young people. And then of course, how that shows up in their adult life. So we recognize that. And we also recognize that parents, they just want their kids to be great. They want them to have better opportunities. You know, parents always say, I want my kids to have it better than I had it. There was things I I didn't get to do or I didn't have, and I want my children to be able to have that. They want to be able to meet their children's needs and solve their problems and fill in the gaps, but they may not always have the capacity to do that and definitely not the capacity to do it alone. And they shouldn't have to. So as we began doing this work, we realized that we were becoming a part of their village, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a decision that the parents make to reach out to us, right? We're not going out there saying, we need to work with your child. Come give me your child. (laughs) We'll fix everything. We're not saying that. We're, We're having conversations. We're letting people know what we do. And parents are recognizing that there's a need that they have to be able to help their children. And so we we know that whatever type of resources that parents secure for their child, that they need to be actively involved and engaged in it, right? Because Mm -hmm. like coming from the school system, I know that anything that we do at school, we're going to send the child back home into their environment and, you know, things are going to continue to be the way they are at home. So if the parent is not engaged in the work that we do with the children, then It gets reversed every time they walk in the house. So when you make a choice to have coaching for your child or counseling or therapy or whatever, you know, we just want to impress upon the parents that, you know, in order for this to work, in order for you to get your time, energy and money worth out of what we're doing, that we need you to show up. And usually they're at a point where they trust you. They have formed some type of relationship with you. And so they let us in and we don't take that lightly. So we, we've decided together as we've been working separately that it's so important that we put a focus on the parent and, and make sure we provide resources for the parents as well as for the child. So hopefully those skills will spill over into their relationship and mm-hmm. then the child can have space to, to grow and learn and transform. So I, I lean on the other part of it, how we position ourselves for strategic partnerships in terms of servicing and, and being there for the child or children, because in addition to it taking the village, everybody has different skill sets and uniqueness that they bring to the table. Even for our young queens, we're not the end all be all. We're real intentional about being positioned. And you, Queen Jaylee, you're one of the folks in our village in terms of helping meet the needs of our young people. And it's a psychological piece back to what my wife was talking about and letting the parents know 
Don't be overwhelmed and antedated with the parenthood journey. Know that it's okay to fail up. And we use strength-based language. And more importantly, we engage with them in a manner to where it speaks to them knowing that they have value in the process. And don't be overwhelmed by it, but we're here together. So we all learn it. Yep. True story. Yes. Yes, the strength-based. Um, so another thing that I wanted to ask y'all, like as parents come in and you coach them about having conversations with their children, what are some of the styles that you may review or you may talk with them about to have like specific or certain conversations with them or deal with a certain behavior? Like, Hey, cause you know, we're no longer, I can't say we're no longer in the stage of pow, pow. <laughs> <laughs> But as they get older, we have to teach the children to have a certain dialogue, a certain language to communicate like their frustrations, their emotions of what they're going through, but also give them an example of how to express those emotions properly. Because we don't want you out here in the street losing your mind, getting all overly excited. And then you have a whole situation now. We on the nine o'clock news, you know. Right, right. (laughs) I'm saying, y'all, it can't happen. (laughs) You know, we want to give you the verbiage. We want to give you the space. We want to give you the know-how to kind of communicate those things that you're going through, even if it's sadness, you know what I mean? Some levels of depression or even some levels of anxiety and frustration, like giving parents the dialogue, but also the example of how they can help their child work through those emotions. So what are some styles that you introduce or talk to parents about that they could use? So everything you just shared, speaks to something that's we're pronounced that we're proponents of is empathy. So okay. seeing it from their kids' perspective or their children's perspective and keeping those sensitivities in mind in terms of how that experience may be impacting them, whether it's something with a friend, grappling with a new subject, and they're used to doing good in school, but they're being challenged and not to feel discouraged by that. So that's one way that we position and share with parents how to engage, look at it from that, and then be listening. Make sure, pay attention to what's said as well as what's not said. Mm -hmm. I pass it to love. (laughs) So we've had a conversation about trauma, right? You and I have had that conversation and just being trauma-informed. And so even, I think everybody needs to be trauma-informed because trauma-informed helps you look through a lens of it's not what's wrong with you, it's what's happened to you, first of all. And second of all, again, the behavior is a form of communication that a need is needs to be met. So I always share with parents, number one, to be trauma informed when it comes to their own life and their own experiences, right? To know their triggers, because that's when it happens. A child is disrespectful and, you know, we ready to go toe to toe, right? And to know that when their voice gets louder or the attitude comes, the stomping comes and all of that stuff, they're not intentionally, in most cases, trying to be disrespectful to you. They don't know the way to communicate. Communication is everything, right? And parents have to model what they want to see in their children. Mm -hmm. So we're sharing with parents the importance of being transparent, And it's okay to be vulnerable with your kids because a lot of times we want to be strong, the authoritative parent that just show up knowing everything and just, you know, like they read the book, they wrote the book. Listen, there is no book. We all figuring this thing out as we go and to let the kids know that. And so to be transparent with them and a good way to do that is through storytelling. We tell stories about our childhood. We tell stories about how we have acquired certain beliefs about how things should be in our household. You know, it may have come from the way our parents or grandparents had us in our household as children. And so realizing we're in a new day, a new age, new times where kids are just different, no matter what you're doing in your house, since they have to leave home every day, they're coming back different. And so we have to be able to adjust. So we definitely focus on communication. We focus on that awareness of self and just understanding their own triggers and giving them the skills and the strategies to be able to calm themselves before they're able to talk to their children. Definitely establishing boundaries and having structure because parents don't follow one particular style, right? Usually they see a combination of these styles. And again, it's all based on their experiences, right? So their childhoods, how things were when they were growing up. So I can share with you the four that psychologists have talked about and, you know, parents can see where they find themselves. 
Mm-hmm. So, of course, there's the authoritarian parenting style. And just like that word sounds, it's kind of harsh, right? So mm-hmm. those types of parents, you know, you believe that kids should be seen and not heard. How many mm-hmm. times have we heard that, right? right? And when it comes to the rules, you know, you believe it's my way or the highway. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I make the rules in this house and you just have to follow them and that's just it. You know, you don't take your kid's feelings or their thoughts or their experiences into consideration. You are running the show. Right. And so, you know, a lot of us have had parents like that, and that's just all we know. But in those situations, the children are at risk. They're at risk of developing self-esteem problems. They realize that their opinions don't really matter. Their opinions are not not valid or valued. And of course, there come some issues with that. You may see some aggression because they're interpreting the behavior of the parent. And if it looks or feel aggressive, then that's how I have to be. So now it's my turn to be a parent. And guess what? A lot of those things get transferred, right? And then there's the authoritative, right? So that sounds a little bit softer, right? The authoritative Mm -hmm. style. And so in that style, you put a lot of effort into creating and maintaining a relationship with your child, which we've been talking about is so important. Just having that relationship and making sure that it's a positive, healthy, nurturing, a strong relationship. You explain the reasons behind your rules or the way you do the things you do, you you share with them why we have to do it like this. But most importantly, you set boundaries and you set limits. You know, you enforce the rules, you give consequences, you don't punish, you give consequences, right? But, and you take your child's thoughts and their feelings into consideration as you're doing this. Mm -hmm. And so researchers have found that kids who have parents who follow the authoritative style is that they're most likely to become responsible adults, right? They feel comfortable advocating for themselves, expressing their opinions, expressing their feelings. They feel like they matter. They're a contributing part of the family. And so that's kind of looked at as the most positive of the four. They use praise and reward systems to try to reinforce that those good behaviors and things like that. Then there is the permissive style, right? We ain't got no rules. We just kind of out there doing it, you know, whatever you you want to do. do. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I'm tired. I've been working all day, you know, two, three jobs. I set the rules, but I just don't feel like enforcing these rules. (laughs) I'm tired. Right. And we understand that. Right. We don't give out consequences or we keep saying, you know, one more time, you do that one more time, you do that one more time. You know, kind of like a a threat um, Mm -hmm. that never comes to fruition. And so you think that your child will learn best with little interference from them. Let them learn from life and let them figure it out on their own. You Mm -hmm. know, you'll learn, you'll learn. I had to learn, you'll learn. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, but that's conducive to kids who grow up and they struggle. You know, they struggle academically. They struggle socially. They just have a hard time adapting. right? Right. Because they haven't had any rules or any structure. So we definitely try to shy away from that. And then you have the uninvolved parent. Once again, you don't ask your child about their schoolwork. You don't ask them about homework. Again, nobody's asking me about my job when I come home. So I ain't asking you about what you got going on. We just, (laughs) everybody just leave the house and they come back and we Mm -hmm. take a shower and go to bed, right? Mm -hmm. I, I just don't have the capacity that we were talking about earlier. You know, they don't know where their children are sometimes. They don't know who they're with. They don't know their friends. And they just don't spend as much quality time, if any, with their child. And that's that uninvolved parent. And so again, researchers have said that the authoritative style is the best style. But again, we don't want parents to feel any type of guilt or shame if they find other qualities of these other styles in the way that they parent. Because again, you do what works for you, but when it's not working and you seek help, we want to find out why isn't it working? Or where those styles are coming from. What beliefs do you have that used to serve you that mm-hmm. no longer serve you as a parent, but you still mm-hmm. bring you bringing them into your adulthood and your parenthood and your marriage, but they no longer serve you, mm-hmm. right? So just helping them kind of, you know, break some of that stuff down and just realize that if they can change their mindset around, again, these new age kids and just try to acquire those skills. So we try to teach those skills, give them opportunities to practice them between sessions or times that we talk to them. And then we come out and see what worked, what didn't work. And we just keep, we keep pushing until we, we figure out what works. So that's how we see it. And Curtis could share a little bit about how we do it mm-hmm. in our household and really how we share when we're being transparent with our parents. So, yeah, as my wife said, frameworks are, they have their place. But in terms of when you get the OJT on the job, you have to be very adaptive and flexible. 
So we like to think of our parenting style more aligned with leadership style, being yes. transformative and adaptive, because we're soliciting input, realizing that our daughters are not the same from, not just from age or birthday to birthday, but from Monday through Friday, uh, every <laughs> week, or Sunday to Saturday. So, well, five <laughs> five. yes, yes. <laughs> So and I, I give you a real life example. The other day I was in here in a conundrum because I couldn't find out what was going on with our youngest daughter. So praise the Lord. I come a long way. So I said, you know what, Curtis, let her have a space and we'll circle back to it. Mm -hmm. So it was resolved. But bottom line is she had something going internally that she didn't want to be bothered while I was trying to explain something to her that she asked about. So at first it puzzled me, but I was like, you know what? Let it go. So just learning how to improve upon that and also them being willing and comfortable enough to come to us and say, mom, dad, we feel about this or this. So very, being very adaptive and inspiring that communication between us, knowing that they have ownership in our relationship and they're invested in it. So with that, they know they realize there's consequences to their choices as well. So we convey this when we're sharing with parents because we're not going to share nothing with them that we're not modeling or practicing. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So we stand by that. We stand on that square. We will not negotiate that square. <laughs> and we also share with our parents that we, we don't claim to have it all figured out, right? Because it's constantly evolving. And so we're in this or on this journey with them, you know, and we can speak to the journey because we're on the journey. You know, we may be a little bit farther ahead of it than them, but we're on the journey as well. And so we have to have that sense of humility Mm -hmm. knowing that we are constantly learning how to do this thing. And, you know, what shared, it basically gave him the opportunity to what we were talking about in responding versus reacting, right? Mm -hmm. Because when we talk about mindset, something could have gone through his head and it could have just looked like disrespect. And he could have reacted based on the fact that he thought she was being disrespectful to him. Mm -hmm. um, and so the other thing is when you create space in between, you know, sometimes you just have to say, Okay, let me give them some space. But that's giving the parent space too, right? Mm -hmm. And so he and I was able to talk about that situation. And he's like, oh, because he's in a house full of women, mm -hmm. right? Raised by women and got my mother and my grandmother, mm -hmm. like women everywhere. Women, mm -hmm. women everywhere, right? <laughs> so sometimes, you know, you just got to pull back a little bit and then have that conversation with somebody you know and trust. If it's not your spouse, somebody else in your circle of support. Mm -hmm. And be able to talk through it and say, okay, maybe there were some things that I didn't think about. Mm -hmm. And so now that I have thought about that, I can approach this differently and I can respond versus mm -hmm. reacting. Right. Which leads me into our next question. What are some of the pillars of healthy parent slash child relationships that the guests should know or should be aware of? Hey, y'all, we'll go over the answer to this question right after the break. So don't go too far. Take a couple of minutes, stretch your legs, get some water, you know, take care of your personal business. And we'll be right back, all right? Just like five seconds. Talk to you soon. All right, wonderful people. We are back. So let's pick up where we left off. Right. Which leads me into our next question. What are some of the pillars of healthy parent slash child relationships that the guests should know or should be aware of? So my wife is accentuated one earlier. Definitely transparency is a pillar. It's, it's very important in terms of establishing rapport and trust when you're being transparent. They're very complementary to each other. And sharing another real life, life example, you know, I had a client where he felt like his mother didn't hold herself to the same standard that she holds the rest of the members of the household to. So this had him in a fit. Like, okay, you're saying X, Y, and Z, but you're doing A, B, C, and D. So we had to break this down. Okay, we identify the root cause of why you're antagonistic towards your mother. Now let's see about set posture myself to have this conversation. So mm -hmm. it was an incremental buildup to being transparent and getting that rapport. So mom, can we broach this? And over the course of four to five weeks, they got to it and flushed it out. And she was receptive to it. Now, that's just not happily ever after, but both of them realized they had work to do in terms of knowing that this is a partnership, not just as a parental child relationship. It's a confluence of both. So that's one, transparency. The other one is the willing to have ownership when you make mistakes. You know, whoever listens to this, no, I apologize to my daughters when it's required because you know what? 
it is what it is. If I was presumptuous or I perceived something that really wasn't there, I have to say, you know what? I apologize and please forgive daddy and it's, and be sure to send the, send the same grace to them and that they reciprocate that. So definitely ownership and account for your mistakes or, you know, whatever, you know, in terms of not meeting the mark. And I'll give one more, then I pass it to love. Being just communicate effectively. Think about the communication style because that changes as well. What they were receptive to at 9 and 11 looks different at 15 and 16. So be mindful to evolve with that as well. <laughs> Absolutely. And so everything that Curtis just said is involved in building safety, right? Because here in the Richmond area where we live, there is a lot of teen and youth violence that's going on, right? We're coming out of pandemic. People are not able to communicate their emotions. They're, they don't know how to respond. And so they're taking permanent solutions to temporary problems, right? Mm -hmm. But when parents are conscious of building safety within their home, then kids and youth don't have to go outside looking for love, looking for acceptance, looking for someone to pat them on the back, saying them a good job, validate them, right? And all these kinds of things. So all of what he was saying is a part of building safety. And I think just as an umbrella term, if, if parents are thinking in terms of, does is my home a safe space for my child? You know, does my, if, if my child is always angry looking and their forehead is always crunched up and they're always stomping through the house, then they're not feeling safe. Their trauma response is on fleek, right? <laughs> it's on 10. So all those reactions are them responding to the environment. And so we definitely want to build safety. And when he was talking about communication, you know, listening is a part of communication, right? Communication is not just always talking. And, you know, we want our parents to be able to listen, to understand, and mm. not listen to respond. Sometimes mm. our kids are talking and, and they say something and you're like, oh, I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't. Or you cut them off, <laughs> right? And you just start talking. And what message does that send to the child, right? We got to think about the messages that we're sending to our children by the way we interact and communicate with them. Mm -hmm. So definitely listening to understand versus listening to respond. And then building that trust you build that trust when you do what you say you're going to do, when you follow through, mm -hmm. right? When you are consistent. And so we had a conversation with one of our daughters and we were talking about, does she feel comfortable coming to us and talking to us about things and sharing? Because she talks a lot. She tells us what's going on in school. She tells us what's happening with her friends, all kinds of stuff. So we're like, okay, let's be cool so we can keep this going, right? <laughs> but what she also said in her 13-year-old self, she said that she would continue sharing with us until we mm -hmm. stop doing what we say we're going to do, right? So if we say that we're going to trust her, if we say that we're going to be open and honest and be willing to listen to her and be willing to give her space to share and to show up as her true and authentic self, and she's like, when that stops, I'll probably stop communicating. I was like, well, all right. <laughs> well, <laughs> all right. That. You know, so that rings in my head every time I, I fall off my, my coach box <laughs> and I forget and I go back to what I know or what I saw as a child, excuse me, <clears throat> then I remember her saying that, you know, and I have to back up a little bit and say, okay, let me give space for her to work through this thing. She had a, a issue with a friend and they were besties on the phone two and three hours a night. And then one day it was just all came crumbling down. I'm like, oh my goodness. And and so, you know, Curtis and I talked and we were like, okay, we got to play the back seat on this because we've talked to her. We've given her the skills. She's mm -hmm. they got SEL in school. We come home and mm -hmm. we talk about it, right? Mm -hmm. She's been in all the camps, all the leadership mm -hmm. camps. We know she got this. She got this. Right. And and the thing is, she solved it and didn't even tell us she solved it. So we had stressed out thinking they're not friends anymore. And she's like, oh, we, we solved that on, on Thursday. And I'm like, why, why you didn't tell us? You know? And I'm like, who approached who first? And she said, I did. I went to her first and I apologize. They both just needed a minute. Mm -hmm. And so we were so proud of ourselves being able to stay out of it and just right. let her do what she does. But I'm just saying all that to say we just exhaled and, and right. took a back seat. So, but just building a safe space to allow them to be themselves and mm -hmm. the independence to try to work through things on their own and not always feel like we have to be in control because then we take their voice 
away mm. from them and they feel like they go places and they, they don't want to talk because you're always the person that's <laughs> talking and, and having the voice for them. Right. Let them have their own voice because it's right. going to translate into their adulthood. Mm-hmm. I, I just like the opportunity or uh, the foot stomp something I was saying about, you know, how the backseat and because as parents, we can have a proclivity to get attached to something. You know, especially when we know our kids' friends real well and we have relationship with their parents, right. it's easy to get caught up in the soap opera or the vortex. So it's really got to be intentional about detaching yourself. And I and I say it for myself, I, I've been an emotional wreck over their friendship. I'm like, ah, you didn't invite her to the party. Oh, you didn't deal with you. Right, you know, you invested because you invested. You know, like, I got the t shirt and everything for well, insert name. So, but it's important. It's a learning curve for me. So, just sharing my testimony and hope it blesses the uh, with parent whoever hears this. <laughs> I know that's right. Because the thing is, I feel like what kids don't understand is that the relationships that they're invested in and the children that they bring around you, like you see them as being part of now the community. So, Absolutely. the same way that you begin to look after, the same way that you look after your child, you begin to look after that other child, and mm-hmm. it becomes part of their upbringing, part of their, you know, all the friend, family things, and all the other stuff, like you said, building community. So Absolutely. when something going on in the community, and you're like, hold on, wait. Yeah. When, when, when this happen? Yeah. We have to have a whole circle. We got to have a, a trust circle or talk around. You know, we have to do the bonfire. What we doing? What we doing? What we what we, what we got to do? Because I need y'all to fix this. Like, right. I done right. put a lot of time. Yep. <laughs> yes, yes. And as parents, we support, we try at least to support each other, right? Right. So, so, so we just getting in good and then y'all want to fall apart. And we're like, <laughs> how are we supposed to handle this? Right. You know, and I reached out to the parent and I said, did you know that this happened today? And she said, yes, I did. And we kind of went back and forth and we agreed to let them handle it. And so uh-huh. that was amazing too. Cause sometimes you don't always get that. Sometimes the parents don't respond that way. Yeah. Right. And so, and so that's it. That's another thing that, you know, we felt like sometimes we have to have those conversations with our friends, parents in a way to kind of share with them how we do things to kind of mm-hmm. be a part of the community, be a part right. of their village. Right. right. And it's been received well. They know we're coaches. So, they may be listening a little bit keener than if 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 they if we weren't right, but you know they're like, okay, help me, help me, because you know we're struggling. You know I'm struggling. I'm trying. I'm trying. Right, <laughs> right. Hey. Yeah, but it's it's good stuff. It's good stuff. We yeah. all out here trying to make it, y'all. We all out here trying to make it. Listen, <laughs> listen. Yes, the struggle is real, but you don't have to be in it by yourself. <laughs> Amen. Yes. Say it one more time. Say it one more time. <laughs> the struggle is real, but you don't have to be <laughs> in it by yourself. <laughs> well, all the way, everybody up there in the balcony in the pew. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, Lord. It's kind of funny. Uh, so that brings us to our next question, because you did talk about a portion of, of trust, right? Mm-hmm. Having to trust your child and trusting that what you taught them and what you've instilled in them, what you have nurtured them with, that it's going to come to pass. It's going to come to fruition. It's going to be exercised. It's going to be used. Mm-hmm. So my next question for you is, how can parents exercise trust building and proper communication skills at home? Mm-hmm. Well, I would say, you know, a lot of what we talked about, right? You have to give them the opportunity to earn trust or don't respond based on your assumption that they're going to make a certain choice, right? You have to give them space and opportunity. And like Curtis said earlier about failing up, you know, they got to bump their head. That's how they learn. That's how they build resilience. And that's how they learn to cope with things, sometimes they got to get banged up a little bit. So you have to trust the process and allow them some space to learn life lessons. And like you said, you've been teaching them all this time, right? And you you hope and pray that they're going to have your voice in the back of their head as they're trying to figure out how to make these decisions. And we do respect the fact that culture and their own community that they've established outside of the home is going to be an impact. But you hope that they can find a sweet spot between their culture, their outside community and their family and what we've been learning and instilling in them since they were babies, <laughs> right? A lot of times I like to think that at the end of the day, that's going to trump. So if you're teaching those good skills, they'll come out and it may not be their first reaction, 
right? It, it like like we're talking about re- responding versus reacting. Mm-hmm. It may not be their first reaction that is the the good solution or the best decision, but you got to give them that space, you know. And so I think when you do that, and then be there when they fall or bump their head or bruise their knee, right? Because then we can we can have a teachable moment. Because then we can talk about it and talk through it. And then next time they'll remember that learned experience, right? And then they'll be able to make the decision quicker and more responsibly the second time around. But knowing that you gave them a little bit of autonomy to try to figure it out on their own. So I definitely think that's how you build that trust. And then again, like I was saying, being consistent, you know, like my daughter told me, if when you switch up, I'm going to switch up. Right. But as long as you remain consistent, I'm remain consistent. She's basically telling me I'm following you. Right. So you're like, okay, all right. So yeah, right. you know, they don't they don't respond to what you say, they respond to what you do, right? Mm-hmm. I forgot how the saying go. They don't yeah, do what you definitely. say, they do what you do. Mm-hmm. Right. And so just modeling that trust in them and then they'll trust you. And then that's how the relationship gets stronger. So real quick, I'm gonna build off of that the modeling because they observe how you respond and react in your other relationships too, you know, with your friends, your coworkers. Mm. So I thought it let me know specifically how they take note to how I interact. (laughs) So if they see that pattern and going to be consistent, if you treat uncle so-and-so with trust or you treat your friends with trust in terms of being good and reciprocal and being honest in terms of how using good language, (laughs) <laughs> then I know that you're being consistent with your espousing to me, not just in the house, but you're, you're the same Curtis or dad, whether you're home or out. So that's important as well. Whoop, whoop. Good stuff. <laughs> Good stuff. So one thing that I do want us to touch on before we go into the professional's lounge is the difference between consequences and punishment. Mm-hmm. Go ahead and break that down for the people. Because I know somebody going to ask, what's the difference? So I'm a, I'm going to gaslight my wife because she's going to come on and grab the mic after I start. <laughs> so That's how we do. <laughs> I, I, I'll start by saying there's an inherent overlap in terms of consequences and punishment where they're inseparable at certain touch points because, because they're both implications of choices. But particularly punishment has a psychological piece to it as well as a regulatory piece to it. If you're talking about, I committed a crime, I got to do whatever, pay a fine. But how you see the implications of that choice psychologically that can determine whether it's a punishment from your purview or not. So that's open and subjective to whatever your experience may be. And consequences, we kind of see them sometimes for the most part as being more objective in terms of cause and effect. And these are case by case, but just as you start to filter out the delineation, that could be some ways in terms of how they veer off into their own respective lanes, but they are overlapping. Yes. All that. Everything you said. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Right. That right there. All that. Right. All that but right what there. I what I would add, you know, going back to we were talking about these these parenting styles and and the difference, the main difference that I saw between those parenting style styles is that the parents are not considering the child in what's what's happening, right? They're they're not trying to have a learning make this a learning experience. Like the the biggest difference that I see between punishment and consequences is the opportunity to learn, right? Because when you punish a child and just take everything away and either exclude them or just take things away from them, it doesn't teach them how to handle this situation when it comes around again, right? Like what we were just talking about. So, you know, punishment, I think, is more for the parent being in control, right? I think it has a lot to do with control, whereas the consequences have have to do with learning or teaching. And so, you know, we come from the lens of the situation that has just happened how can I make this a teachable moment and make sure that my child learns how to cope in this type of situation or to deal with this situation or how to respond to the situation the next time it happens, then, you know, you're showing them that the consequences of their behavior is this. 
And if this is something that is not favorable to them, then we won't do that again. But we give them an opportunity to have that conversation versus this is what you did. This is what your punishment is going to be. There's going to be no conversation and you just deal with it. Mm. Right. Mm. (laughs) So I, I just think that, you know, having the child play an active part in understanding the ramifications of their behavior is when you determine by whether you are using, showing them the consequences of their behavior and how things are not turning out how they wanted them to be versus you did it wrong. And this is, this is how we're going to treat you based on what you did. And you find some way to learn from that. (laughs) Right. You won't, right. You won't. But at the end of the day, I think it's more about parent control when Mm. they choose to use punishment versus over consequences. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a good time for us to go into Professionals Lounge. Professionals Lounge is a segment of the show that allows guests to share advice and tips with other practitioners in the out-of-school time and youth development field about how they can begin growing their gifts and talents, but also developing themselves as professionals in the field. With that being said, let's go ahead and jump into our Professionals Lounge conversation. All right, y'all. So for our professionals lounge question, what are some strategies out of school time professionals can use to foster parent student relationships in their program? Mm. Yeah, that's a good one. So I do have an after school program, right? In my nine to five, I run an after school program. And in trying to strengthen the bonds between parents and child. I mean, we work mostly primarily with the child, but because my program is in the community where the children live, we do have more access to the parents than the average program. Because some programs, you know, the kids go from school, but they get bus from here to there and then, you know, bus back home and then they go home and the parents are not really involved much except for signing them up for the program. But I think if you are adding portions to your program that allow parents to come in and engage with the kids in the activity. So what you're teaching the child, you invite the parents to come to the program and allow activities and experiences for them to be able to apply that new knowledge. Because now they're not at home with, you know, the way things usually go at home. They're in this structured environment where they can feel safe to kind of show the parents what they've been learning. You know what I'm saying? And they can learn together. It's all about growing together. So I definitely think that out-of-school time programs can foster healthy relationships by having engagement activities. I also think that there should be opportunities for parents to get together to support each other. And so I have a program that's similar to that and allowing parents to come. Sometimes it's one of those things where you know, they each just want to tell their story about the struggles they have and what their kid's not doing and whatever, you know, but because you're in that structured environment and you're there to facilitate the conversation, then you can draw them in and find a way for them to learn from the conversation versus it just being, we just going to sit here and just bad mouth our kids the whole time. Like they do, you know, (laughs) maybe in the community, we want to provide that safe space so that they can do it. And you can kind of support that conversation and maybe share different beliefs. And then, and then, oh my gosh, there's strength in getting the parents together right? That collaborative effort, because maybe you're struggling in one area that I'm actually doing okay in. And maybe I'm struggling in an area that you're doing okay in. And so just like we talk about kids, peer to peer, they learn more from each other. And the same thing with parents, you put them in a room together, but you are jig about making sure that your parents have different skills that you bring together, then those parents can learn from each other. And I think that's an awesome thing. The last thing I'll say is personal development as parents, parenting programs that allow them, even if it's virtual or something that's recorded that they can watch at home, they may watch it, they may not watch it, but you want to provide that for the parents who need that support will show up and give incentives, you know, and they'll show up and they'll tell to and they'll tell to. Mm-hmm. And then hopefully you can get the majority of your parents having this personal or parent development portion. And then they can kind of meet their kids where they are with what they're learning in your program and what you're teaching the parents. And hopefully they can find that sweet spot. I know that's right. So as always, my wife knocked out the part in terms of 
addressing that question, I'll just add one more piece and it's going to focus more on the relationship between as a facilitator to the parents, because it's important for them to get a feel for you as well as a person and establish that trust and rapport. So when they can serve as the substratum or the undergird to hold up these sessions where they feel comfortable starting to open up. And I know you've probably seen this both in the group settings, well, in coaching with kids, you know, you had that separate dialogue with them and they're like, okay, Curtis, okay, Yolanda. And then it starts to foster that synergy. And so now everybody's holding everybody accountable because now we have truly established a village. And now we break it out to what, like my wife said, with the interactive and the input. And I just want to give my men a shout out because there's so much for the men in it as the fatherhood piece I hear that we're working on mm-hmm. in terms, and, you, and it's tier two where you're talking 19 to 25, 25 to 30, only to the well into their 50s. So it's very important to have that support structure as men for each other as well. And particularly when you talk about blended families and integration from incarceration. So that's very key. Mm -hmm. So I know that's a whole nother block we could do, but I'm in that right now. So I just felt compelled to speak to it. Yes. And I believe that it is very important that we are intentional about piggybacking off of what Curtis said about finding men to be a part of our out of school time programs. You know, you go to those programs and you see naturally women gravitate towards these types of positions. But I think whoever's in charge needs to be intentional about going out there and finding some men, some men who look like the children to come in and to be an influence. And then they can be the voice at the table to help us understand how to pull the dads in, how to connect with the fathers and things like that. So I I definitely think we just have to be intentional when we are working on these relationships to include certain people in the equation, make sure they're at the table so that we know how to approach the situation and how to be the most effective. Well, everybody, that brings us to the end of our show. I'd like to thank Curtis and Yolanda for being amazing guests. You all are always welcome to come back and continue to share these jewels and these gems with us. Hopefully, we'll be able to get a chance to do it soon. And go ahead and check out their live that we did on Instagram. We did a pre-show about the episode that also has more good information to it. So check that out on my Instagram at School After Hours. Once again, that is at School After Hours. If you enjoyed this episode and feel you received some good information, give us a review on Apple Podcasts or visit the Podchasers website and leave us a comment. This will help us get some feedback on the show and collect testimonials for our personal website. Share us, share us, share us, share us, share us with your friends, share us with your family, share us with your network. Help us spread the word about how OST programming is empowering our youth as well as our communities. We can be found on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Podcast Act. Well, that's all I have for today. In the words of Mr. Arthur Ashe, start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. Until next time, bye-bye.